all for being here. We thank you, Beth. Um, we're really excited to have folks here today for our last uh, Child Outcomes Accountability Team meeting of 2022. Uh, we have a exciting agenda, so I'm glad I'm glad so many folks are able able to join us here today, despite our proximity to the holidays. Um, I am going to ask, just given given kind of our packed agenda and what we want to get through today, I'm going to ask that folks make introductions in the chat, please. Um, I wish we had time for for more robust uh, introductions, especially considering we have so many new faces joining us. But I'm going to ask that people kind of put their name and organization and role um, in the chat in lieu of that. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and give give folks a reminder that if you're not currently speaking, um, if you could go ahead and mute, please, so that we all have the best audio experience. That would be great. Um, and yeah, I guess I should introduce myself since there are some new faces. Um, it's great to be with you all. I'm Anna Brulette, and I'm Building Bright Futures Policy and Program Director, and I support the, the work of the Child Outcomes Accountability Team on behalf of, or with, with the help of um, some of my other BBF colleagues that have joined us today, including Beth Druzanski. Um, and with that, I think we're gonna get started. Uh, and I think folks will kind of continue, continue to trickle in. Um, so our agenda today, um, as, I, as I mentioned at the top, is really to start to explore a little bit more um, given, given this committee's previous kind of conversations uh, that have briefly touched on housing. We wanted to kind of take a, take a, take a deeper dive and explore um, housing as it relates to supporting kids and families and where explore more where it intersects with our work and goals as a committee. Um, so we've, we've invited several folks to join us today to, to explore that both on the kind of the state wide level, as well as on, on a more regional one. Um, and we're hopefully going to leave a lot of time for a really great conversation about how their their roles and how their work intersects with our own, um, and we'll we'll kind of we'll keep a lot of time and space for that. Um, so I'm going to check in, Lily. How are you doing tech wise? Do you want someone else to go first, or are you set up okay? Um, I'm. I can go just via phone. Hi, everyone. I'm Lily Sojourner with the Office of Economic Opportunity. I'm still trying to work through computer issues, but Anna has the slides, so I'm happy to just talk as you share them if um, that works for you, Anna. Absolutely. That's fine by me. Um, I will go ahead and share share my screen, and we're going to ask kind of the folks hold clarifying questions, I think, until until the end, if that, if that makes sense for folks, because we have quite a bit to get through. Yeah, and I'll try to go quickly. I'm um, the Community Services Program Manager for Family Supportive Housing, um, which is one of the many programs that OEO supports. We're an office within the Department for Children and Families, and we support a lot of our um, housing and homelessness providers across the state, as well as weatherization and anti-poverty programs such as micro business development. Um, but today I'm gonna to talk about the Family Supportive Housing Program. And um, in particular, share some information as it relates to homelessness and families. And so if Anna can go to the next slide, I just wanted to share some data from the 2022 point in time count. Um, and so if you actually go back, maybe two more, there we go. The Anna can send these out after the title um, is a hyperlink, so that'll link to the actual point in time count summary that has a lot more data and analysis. But you can just see looking at the graph, um, just statewide is the blue line, orange is the balance of state continuum of care, which is sort of the communities outside of Chittenden County, and then the gray at the bottom is Chittenden County. But you can see an increase in total persons experiencing homelessness quite a bit over the past two years. It's a pretty significant jump. If you go to the next slide, Anna, um, this shows the breakdown um, by household type. And so the blue households 
are those that have at least one adult and one child. Um, and so again, you can just see that that families have also been impacted by this overall increase. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, this is the number of children in Vermont shelters. Um, the children are the orange. And this is interesting because, you know, obviously COVID has context for all of this. So you can kind of see policy changes such as the expansion of the general assistance emergency housing program really um, in some ways captured, I think, those households who are experiencing homelessness in a new way over the past couple of years. You can also see how sort of COVID mitigation and prevention measures have impacted shelters who had to maybe ramp down operations in 2020 and 2021. And then you can see over the past year, um, things have been picking up. But our shelters um, are definitely kind of in a new world in terms of how they're set up and how they're supporting families and kind of what their approach is um, just to general kind of like public health approach. Um, so again, I think this is just important to kind of help set the context of, of what's going on with kiddos and families. Um, if you go to the next slide, Anna, this is sort of a state or national perspective just around how um, homelessness impacts early childhood and um, especially those kiddos under six. And um, again, you can just really see the intersection between homelessness and early childhood, which again, I think is um, what sort of drives us when we develop programs and maintain programs like family supportive housing. So if you go to the next slide, this is an overview. Family supportive housing is an evidence-based housing intervention that um, includes wraparound supportive services. It's sort of one leg of the stool, if you've heard that analogy before, for you know, really to have a successful housing program or a successful housing, you need the unit, you might need financial assistance, and then you need services. So family supportive housing really is those services. Um, it's, it follows the practice framework developed by um, the Child Welfare and Supportive Housing Resource Center, Center for Study of Social Policy, and the Corporation for Supportive Housing. Um, and it really is those targeted for, um, who have a really need for high level of, of services. And I'll explain more of the components. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Anna. So in Vermont, we fund this program with a combination of general fund and Medicaid dollars. In 2016, we were able to start utilizing Medicaid funds and that has allowed us to expand the program. Again, the goal is toward, to address um, homelessness for, for households. So reduce you know, the incidence and duration, focus on the root causes and then support parents' um, resiliency. And if you go to the next slide, we do that through a combination of housing navigation. So um, helping households get into housing, but then also housing retention. So this program is not a short-term program. Households can be in the program, you know, really as long as it's, it's benefiting them. I think on average, we see households in the program for two years. So they're really able to work with their uh, service coordinators once they are housed to work on whatever the barriers might be to sustain that tenancy, tenancy and really help ensure that they stay housed and they're not cycling back into homelessness. Um, so if you go to the next slide, here are the key program components. Um, so we do not, we're not able to include direct rental assistance. However, we, our service coordinators work with housing providers to help find housing. And they do this in a couple of ways. All of our providers have MOUs with landlords in their communities. Those vary regionally, but that um, is a relationship that we expect. So the provider is able to say, you know, 
this is an FSH household and they have landlords who are sort of willing to work with that household. Again, the kind of capacity and what that relationship looks like really varies by location. Um, FSH providers leverage family unification vouchers and other vouchers. Um, for those of you who are aware of the CARES vouchers that were out as part of the um, you know, COVID response plan, a lot of FSH households were able to use CARES vouchers to get housed. Service coordinators provide um, really individualized services. They have caseloads capped at 15 families. Each family has their own plan that they're working on. We have a real emphasis on financial empowerment. Our program includes um, a family savings account program that, that families can participate in and get incentives for savings. We utilize the Strengthening Families Framework. I think I saw Amy Bolger on that call and she's done some cross-training with, with us, which has been great. And we really try to use um, a holistic approach for the whole family. So the next um, slide talks about sort of prioritization and eligibility. All households are literally homeless when they come into the program. So they're referred through what's called our coordinated entry system. Um, this is a system around the state. It assesses households who are homeless um, and it assesses eligibility. And then it's looking at these sort of priority factors to generate a referral list for each provider. So families who've had multiple episodes or a prolonged episode of homelessness, so that's over 12 months. Families that are open or have active case with Family Services, the Child Welfare Division of DCF, and then families who have at least one child under six. So that's sort of how we prioritize this resource for, for families and communities. And if you go to the next slide, this is a summary of um, where we have the program currently. Uh, we have nine providers state or in 10 districts statewide. You'll notice we are not in the Lamoille or Addison uh, counties at this point, but you can see who our providers are. Um, most serve one community. And we kind of look at this as like AHS districts, for those of you who are familiar with that concept. So Brattleboro is. Um, you know, roughly that AHS district or, or that county, not just the city of Brattleboro. Um, if you go to the next slide, this is just, um, we recently did our annual report for the past state fiscal year. And again, that SFY22 program overview is a hyperlink. So you can click on that report to, to dive deeper into our outcomes from last year. But um, we served 368 families at some point during the year, which included uh, 416 children under the age of six. Uh, you can see over the past five years how the program has expanded. The big jump between SFY20 and SFY21 is when we um, were really able to increase our service coordinator capacity around the state. We had a large um, you know, expansion in funding. And, you know, I think it was like an 80%, 90% increase in service coordinator capacity and, and programs have been staffing up since then. So that sort of explains, explains that jump. Um, and again, there's a lot in that program overview, but um, I know we're limited for time here. So if you go to the next slide, and happy to take questions. I, I know I'm rushing through, but I know there's also other great presenters that we wanna make sure you hear from today. So this year, you know, we remain aware that, that we're not present in the Middlebury and Morrisville AHS districts. Um, and then really our areas of focus with our community of practice this year are in response to our annual report. We've seen family engagement go down a little bit. It's still 90%, but sort of pre-COVID, we were like 95, 97%. You know, we think it's just been harder um, as people are navigating, you know, health issues, uh, school closures. Um, you know, I think families may be feeling 
more hopeless if they've been in a hotel for a really long time and maybe not as willing or, you know, feeling like engaging will, will be beneficial. So, so we really want to dive into that. We've seen our numbers of households who are involved with family services really go down and we're not sure if that means things are going well when families are in our program or if we're just not connecting to those families um, as much as we could. And so we, we really want to look into that. And then financial wellness, um, you know, looking at how we can kind of help households with their savings. Um, again, we sort of saw a dip in that the past couple years and you know, again, thinking that, you know, people's bandwidth was just not there to, to do that. So we, those are areas that we really want to revisit with our community of service coordinators this year as our top priority areas for um, assessment and kind of group focus. Um, and so that wraps it up. The next slide is just our contact information. Um, Rob Petrini is the program officer who who really works closely with with these households. Um, I support Rob, and then Sarah Phillips is our director. And then at the bottom, the Office of Opportunity Office of Economic Opportunity Reports um, is where you can find our annual award summary. And so that is like where we talk about who we're funding, um, which again here you have on a previous slide, as well as you know, our, our annual reports from um, the previous years. Um, and I saw the question from Anne around family engagement. And we look at um, how many families are consistently meeting the monthly. We have a target of at least a once a month um, meeting with the household. And so that's what we look at is the families that are able to, you know, throughout the year do that consistently. And, um, you know, we were able to leverage telemedicine during COVID, which I think was really helpful. But I think even with that, um, you know, we're, we're kind of more away from that now. But, you know, I think there's just been barriers with, like I said, illness, childcare, um, and again, our staff, our service coordinators are kind of reporting, you know, households who have been in the motel, some of them since, you know, March of 2020, just really kind of feeling, um, you know, not as, uh, just not as engaged, you know, kind of in a, in a different space, I think, because of that circumstance. Um, and Linda's question, we, um, we in 2020, we did put out um, an RFP across districts. Our priority areas when we look at districts are really, um, we look at information from the point in time, you know, based on county, how many homeless households or households experiencing homelessness are in each community. We look at how many households are in um, the GA emergency housing program. You know, so we're looking at that data to see where the need is. Um, Middlebury and Morrisville have been sort of our smallest districts in terms of you know population on those two measures. Um, and I think you know it's that's really a kind of legislative question or you know budget question each year um, in terms of being able to expand FSH. When we expanded in 2020, we were able to go from seven of the AHS districts to 10. So that was really exciting. We added Springfield, Newport, and St. Albans. Um, so, you know, we would love to at some point be statewide and even, you know, increase the presence um, in other communities. We have between one and three service coordinators in each community. Um, again, based on some of that data with where we see the highest numbers of families experiencing homelessness. Excellent. Does anyone else have any kind of clarifying questions for Lily?
Okay. I think that was a long enough pause. So we though I think there will certainly will be more time, um, more time for discussion. So if, if Lily, if you are able to stay with us, that would be wonderful. Um, we are going to to move along and hear from another partner doing statewide work related to supporting um, supporting children and families experiencing homelessness. Um, so I'm going to move us right along to, to Katie Preston, who serves as the state coordinator for homeless education at AOE. Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I have to apologize. I am sick and lost my voice. So um, sorry in advance. <laughs> um, I am also going to try to share my screen really quickly here. See how I do with that. Um, can you see that? No. Wait, hold on. How about now? Yeah, that works. Okay. Now where did my notes go? Um, okay, so thanks everyone for bearing with me. Um, yeah, my name is Katie Preston. I am the state coordinator for homeless education um, at the Agency of Education. So um, in general, what that means is I support our school districts and supervisory unions in um, identifying students experiencing homelessness and just making sure they're connected to whatever supports they need and are eligible for. Um, so today I am gonna just try to keep things really high level. Um, just like nothing high level about this particular law, but I'll do my best to kind of give a really sort of general overview of um, kind of the three questions that come up a lot, which are, are students eligible? Where can they go to school? And then what can the school or the district provide? Um, and I'm just, I will just assume that like nobody's ever heard of the McKinney-Vento Act before, which is likely not true, but um, again, I'll just try to kind of provide some of that really basic information. So, um, okay. So the McKinney-Vento Act is, you know, our, our primary federal legislation um, regarding the education of homeless children and youth. Uh, so it, again, it provides that definition for eligibility um, the rights of students who are experiencing homelessness, um, making sure that children and youth who are experiencing homelessness have equal and immediate access to public education. And the same, you know, when we say equal, like the same public education that a student who is not experiencing homelessness would receive. Um, and then provides uh, requirements for districts around educational support to promote school success. Um, so this education, the education subtitle of the McKinney-Vento Act, which is what we're going to talk about today, is authorized under the Every Student Succeeds Act, just as like a historical point. <laughs> so that's sort of why I'm based in the Agency of Education and not, not elsewhere. Um, okay, so just to give a kind of quick overview of the definition, um, the education definition of homelessness or making evento act definition is much more broad than I think a lot of people tend to think about, you know, what is homelessness? It is much more broad than literal homelessness. And it does capture those uh, students who are precariously housed. So um, just to kind of read through this in general, we consider children who lack a fixed, regular and adequate nighttime residence as eligible for McKinney-Vento. That can include students who are sharing the housing of other people due to loss of housing, economic hardship, or a similar reason. Those students who are living in hotels, motels, trailer parks, camping grounds, due to lack of alternative adequate accommodations. Those who are living in emergency or transitional shelters or have been abandoned living in a public or private place that's not designed for or ordinarily used as a regular sleeping accommodation, living in cars, parks, public spaces, abandoned buildings, substandard housing, 
foster train stations or similar settings. And then it also includes migratory students who are um, living in those above circumstances. So um, fairly broad, I think. And uh, when we talk about fixed, regular and adequate, we mean, is it fixed as in like permanently attached to the ground? Um, is it regular as in, can they go there every night, um, lay their head down in the same place? And then is it adequate? Does it provide the safe, um, the safety uh, that a typical home would provide? Um, so do we have, you know, people sleeping in a dining room or a kitchen or um, is the housing substandard? You know, do they have heat and running, running water, things of those nature? Um, okay. So once a student's been determined eligible under the McKinney-Vento Act, they have, um, you know, they're afforded some, some rights under that act, including equal access to the same free appropriate public education, including public preschool education that's provided to all other children and youth, immediate enrollment, even if they don't have the necessary paperwork, that can include things like obviously residency paperwork, but also immunization requirements, um, if they don't have their records from their previous school, if they've been determined eligible, um, they can be immediately enrolled and then all of those things can be dealt with afterwards. They have the right to remain in their school of origin if it's in the student's best interest. Um, one of the biggest sort of tenets of this law is really to maintain educational stability. So if you have really highly mobile families who are moving around a lot throughout the state, um, the student does have the right to stay in that school of origin where they were uh, previously enrolled um, and attending as long as it's in their best interest. They also have a right to, of course, receive all educational and related services for which they're eligible. So this things like access to Head Start, early intervention and preschool programs, um, Title I-A services, they are categorically eligible for free school meals. Um, the right to full participation in school, which can include extracurricular activities, and then also transportation if it's needed, uh, provided by the LEA back and forth um, from the school of origin. So this is, I would say, particularly important when you have a student who, um, you know, the family's living in one, one district, they become homeless and they move out of that district to another one, and the student is gonna remain in their school of origin. If that family needs transportation back and forth, the LEA needs to provide that. Um, specifically around preschool programs, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot, everything I just said is, is sort of still applies, but um, bears repeating, you know, that this is true for preschool programs as well. Um, so again, the right to remain in the, in the preschool of origin, the right to receive transportation, to the preschool of origin, even if it's not typically provided by the LEA, uh, immediate enrollment. And then best practice would have LEAs holding spots um, or prioritizing students who are identified as experiencing homelessness on wait lists. The McKinney-Vento the McKinney -Vento Act is not gonna require an LEA to exceed any sort of capacity. Um, again, it really doesn't require that LEAs hold those spots, but that is definitely strongly encouraged and best practice. Um, one really important thing that I want to note is that the McKinney-Vento Act under ESSA um, only applies to public preschools. And so this can be a little bit confusing, particularly because, um, because of our universal pre-K here. So when we're talking about public preschool, which is not defined in ESSA at all, uh, we kind of use this list of um, factors to determine whether or not a, a student would be eligible to remain in a preschool of origin. Um, so I think the key, the key thing here is, is it operated or administered by the LEA? Um, that's kind of where we, we tend to go back to, like, does the LEA operate this preschool program? Is it part of the LEA's, um, you know, building or, or operations? And then also Head Start programs. Um, the Head Start Act has its own sort of requirements, but they are very similar around school of origin. Um, so I won't read through this whole list, but I just wanted to 
make sure that was really clear that when we're talking about school of origin, it really is public preschools. Um, and then I'll just briefly go through this one again, sort of trying to determine whether or not um, a student is eligible to stay in a preschool, whether or not it's a school of origin. We can ask, you know, like, does do all the students that are in this preschool kind of automatically feed into a kindergarten program at a district? If the answer is yes, then that's a feeder school and that student has the right to stay in that school of origin. And if it's not, then it is not a feeder school. Um, and while that doesn't mean that the district can't support the student, it does mean that that student doesn't necessarily have the right to remain in the school of origin and receive transportation. So just kind of a, um, that question comes up a lot. Um, and I'll skip this slide because it's basically the same thing said in a different way. Um, and then lastly, I just want to talk really quickly. I mean, I probably don't need to tell anybody on this call about some of the major barriers that students experiencing homelessness face, um, but particularly around, you know, preschool and early childhood, um, some major barriers, including just lack of identification. Um, we can't support students who are experiencing homelessness if we don't know that they're in that situation. Um, and that can be related to just a whole host of factors, um, you know, parents who don't realize that their, their living situation does meet that definition of homelessness under McKinney-Vento, um, fear of, you know, if I tell somebody in the school system that we're experiencing homelessness, uh, what are they gonna call DCF? Are they gonna, you know, take my kids away? Just that real genuine fear of, of what that might mean. Um, high mobility, right? So students to families just moving around a lot and um, kind of getting missed. And then um, poor health, fatigue, hunger, that lack of necessary enrollment paperwork. Again, this just goes back to sort of that education piece on the, on the part of the schools. Um, you know, when we have a student who's, who's eligible, they don't need that enrollment paperwork right away. Lack of awareness huge barrier around lack of transportation. Um, you know, A, knowing that it's, it could be available and then B, just is, is, is there transportation? You know, how do we transport this student? Um, and then again, like lack of space in preschool programs. So um, really broadly, there's a, the, an ongoing requirement on the part of the state um, and schools and school districts to remove those barriers to, um, to education uh, for all students who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so, you know, we are working all the time to just make sure that, you know, those, the education piece is happening on the part of the school districts and also just getting the word out um, to people like you and to parents, families, um, to try to make sure that folks know what what they can access and how to access it. Um, and then just lastly, this is my contact information. Uh, we post a list on our Agency of Education website for the contact list for homeless liaisons. Every school district and supervisory union in the state has one. Um, so if you have questions, you can reach out directly to that person in your area, or you can also always reach out to me. I'm happy to answer questions anytime. Okay, and I'm gonna stop sharing. And I see there are questions in the chat, I think. Thank you, Kelly. Katie, super interesting. Um, there's a question from um, Megan. Um, does this include transportation from after school activities or I think just at the end of the day? I could. It could. Yeah, if you have a student who's um, doing, uh, again, this is going to go back to like, is this a, a school based activity, something that's overseen by the supervisor union or school district, you know, like school sports or uh, after school, then yes, potentially. Great. Any um, other clarifying yeah, questions? I, sorry, I should just yeah. add, the key is, uh, is transportation a barrier? If that student can't get back and forth to, um, you know, 
basketball practice, you know, I, whatever, whatever the thing is um, that they really are, they are participating in as part of their school, you know, even though it's after school, um, if they can't get back and forth to that, we would consider that a barrier and the school district has a requirement to remove that barrier. So getting, sometimes it looks a little bit creative, I would say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. So given our time, we have yeah, sorry. all this really information. No, you did a great job. Um, I'm going to keep us moving to Jess Hyman um, from Champlain Valley Office of Eco Economic Opportunity. And then um, I'm going to propose that we kind of keep moving with our presenters so that we can kind of condense our discussion to the end. So, um, so Jess, we'll let you go. And then um, Kristen, I'll have you go um, from kind of a regional perspective and then would love us to have time for discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jess Hyman with CVOEO's Statewide Housing Advocacy Programs. Um, and I'm going to take a step back and talk a little more about Vermont's housing landscape and affordability and access, and also talk about some of CVOEO's statewide uh, services and programs that um, serve, serve families and others. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay, can folks see that okay? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So first off, you know, I'm, I'm going to be sharing some information probably every, everyone knows, but I think it's really important to, to put some numbers to, to what we all know, which is that Vermont, like most of the country, is in the middle of a, a serious housing shortage. Um, and that means it can be hard for everyone to find safe and stable and affordable housing. Um, you know, earlier this year, Vermont's rental vacancy rate was 2.4%, you know, down almost two points from a few years before. Um, and it was less than 1%. 0.4 in the Burlington area. And so what that means is for every 100 apartments out there, fewer than, in the Burlington area, fewer than one is available at any given time. Um, and meanwhile, the medium, median house price for, uh, for Vermont has been shooting up. It's 295,000 um, statewide and 467,000 in Chittenden County. So that makes it really difficult for people at all income levels to find housing and to find rentals, and especially folks at the lowest income income levels. Um, and additionally, you know, due to a long history of, of discrimination, you know, uh, BIPOC and households have a much lower home ownership rate than white households. Um, so nationally, uh, white home ownership rates are about 70% and black home ownership rates are about 42%. In, in Vermont, black home, home ownership rates are only 21%, so less than half the national average. Um, and discrimination shows up, of course, in the rental market too. Um, and then we look at the cost of housing. Um, so according to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, the, uh, the housing wage needed for a two bedroom apartment in, in Vermont is $23.40 an hour. So a household would need to earn $23.40 an hour to afford a two bedroom a household. And that's much higher in, in you know, Chittenden County. Um, so, we're seeing a lot of people priced out of the rental market uh, and, and priced out of the, the home purchase market. And, and of course, we've just heard about um, the, the experiences of families experiencing homelessness. Um, so it, it's really in a tough situation and there just simply isn't enough housing in the state. Uh, Pre-pandemic, um, it was estimated we had a shortage of almost 6,000 homes in the state um, and that number, number continues to grow. Um, and then there are you know, some of the you know, these systemic failures that have resulted in inequities in housing as well. Um, so, you know, we, we can talk, we've talked about the, there's the impact of homelessness on families, but also there's a really strong impact of house, just general housing instability and poor conditions. So we hear every day on our hotline about rental properties uh, where families with young children are living without heat, without proper um, 
in insulation with pest issues um, and these poor conditions are create a really unstable environment of course for our families um, and also the family stress related to unaffordability can have other and can have other um, repercussions as well you know because we and I don't have to to, to tell this group, you know, how, how much we, where we live impacts the um, every aspect of our of our lives. Um, and so in this tight housing market, you know, everyone's feeling the crunch and it's exponentially worse for people who are traditionally subject to discrimination and exclusion. And that includes a black and indigenous people of color. It includes um, LGBTQ folks, people with disabilities, and especially families with children. Um, so we do have protections, of course, in federal and federal and state law. The Fair Housing Act pr protects against discrimination um, based on race, skin color, national origin, disability, family status, which is having kids, um, religion, sexual or orientation, gender identity, et cetera, uh, the receipt of public assistance, uh, marital status, um, and uh, the victims of abuse, sexual assault, and stalking. Um, and the Fair Housing Act also requires that we do more than just not discriminate, but to take steps to uh, address and redress historical patterns of segregation and exclusion. Um, so, you know, and here in Vermont, we, uh, we see a lot of discrimination based on um, uh, family status, which is the presence of minor children. Um, often uh, families, Families, when they're looking to to rent or purchase, are excluded from housing opportunities simply because they have kids. Families exiting homelessness have a lot of challenges finding um, appropriate housing um, due to discrimination, but then also the, to the lack of availability because um, it's it, 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 with the housing that's available, um, no, a very little of it is housing with multiple bedrooms. So even, even as folks are moving out of home of homelessness, finding that place where, where they'll, they can have safe and safe and stable health housing is real is really challenging. So combining the low vacancy rates, the challenge of finding apartments with a high number of bedrooms, it puts families with kids at an even, even higher risk. And so there are there are protections um, and there are resources here in Vermont and, and elsewhere for um, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for, for folks to, um, to, to report uh, and file complaints uh, against discrimination. Uh, one of those programs is through the Fair Housing Project, um, and then we also partner with our enforcement partners at the Human Rights Commission, Vermont Legal Aid, and HUD. Um, so, you know, when we look at the gap, there's the gaps in affordability, the gaps in accessibility and availability, um, and also the gaps in long-term stability services. So, um, you know, we need to ensure that there isn't just um, enough housing for everyone, but that there are those wraparound supports that that can help. And so some of the programs that were just mentioned help with that. And I'm sort of sp I'm speeding along here because I know that we're we're a little rushed for for time. Um, you know, I think that it's important to note that there has been an, an unprecedented amount of money going into um, short term crisis relief and rental assistance over the past few years, which is amazing. And there's also a lot of money that's going towards housing development all over the state. Um, you know, communities large and small are looking at their zoning. Um, and removing exclusionary zoning barriers um, and identifying ways to make homes more accessible for more people. And so in theory, this should alleviate some of the pressure and open up some housing opportunities for, for everyone and especially for, um, for families. Um, but we need to be really careful and intentional in the, the decisions about where homes are built and who has access to them. Um, and so there are a number of, of things that that we can do, uh, and and I'm going to skip ahead to some of the resources available through C CBOEO um, to support families who are renting, living in mobile homes, uh, and experiencing discrimination. So we have a wealth of, of renters resources on our website. Um, we have information about rights and responsibilities. We have a, a statewide hotline that any renter can call. Um, 
And we also have a number of, of, of workshops and other resources. And we'll share the slides with all these links later. Um, there's a, a new program that CDOEO's Housing Advocacy Programs is offering, which is a home family voucher program. So this builds on the success of the CARES Housing Voucher Program that Lily mentioned earlier, and will be available to uh, families experiencing homelessness. This will be launched next year. Um, it'll provide um, 12 months uh, of of vouchers with the opportunity to extend up till June 2024. Um, it'll these vouchers will be connected to tenant education retention services, um, and these are funded through HOP and administered by CBOEO. Um, there, are, of course. Uh, resources for families available through CBOEO and the other community action agencies. Um, one a big thing to know about is, uh, is HOP funds, which can provide security deposit and background assistance. And of course, housing case, case management, um, other, other assistance and other assistance programs. Um, I'm going to skip this. I'll share all these resources uh, with you. Um, key key connection points for CBO, CBOEO's housing advocacy programs, uh, Vermont tenants um, with, with that hotline and follow-up services, um, the Fair Housing Project you know, for any, any family experiencing discrimination in their housing, um, and then of course the mobile home program, which works with um, folks living in mobile home communities. So I will stop sharing here. Um, on the on the resource on the resource list that I'll share, there's also there are also links to a number of programs um, available from our partners, and also some data resource links that are really helpful. Um, you know, if you want to look at some of the housing data in your communities and your regions as well. So I will share those with Anna to send to send along. Thank you, Jess. There was one clarifying question from Maria. Um, what the date? Uh, what is the date that next year uh, the new vouchers will be available? Ex excellent question. So the program will launch in January, um, and so the but the the voucher start date um, hasn't been defined yet. Um, it'll be early in the year. Um, and I see another question. How is affordable housing defined? Excellent question. So generally, Cynthia, um, affordable housing is defined as paying no more than 30% of your income on housing and housing related costs. Um, more than half of uh, the, uh, sorry, there, there's an extremely high percentage of, of people in Vermont paying more than 30%. Um, and more than 50% as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So much important information. How are folks doing? You soaking it in? Thumbs up. Thank you, Kristen. That was helpful. Um, all right. Any other clarifying questions from our kind of statewide perspective? Okay. Can Thanks, I Megan. just ask a Oh, sorry. I just wanted to ask a, a question about the um, McKinney-Vento Act, and I'm just curious. Uh, my experience as a director in uh, the old north end of Burlington was that we had fairly every year we had a fair number of families who would um, be homeless or experience homelessness. And I'm just curious, is it worth looking at that act to think about how early childhood programming might be included Um more holistically in that act, the whole definition around LEA and universal pre-K, I'm just wondering if it's worth looking at or are folks in the housing community like, no, don't touch that act. Uh, it's fine as it is. I'm just curious what opportunities might lie there. I can sort of speak to that. <laughs> so I would love, I would love nothing more if that act included went beyond public pre-K because it's one of the biggest, one of the hardest conversations I have with liaisons is when they're like, we've got this family, we would love to keep them, you know, in this school, um, but the McKinney Act, Vento Act doesn't cover, you know, private pre-K programs. Uh, I will say it's a federal act, so it would take a, an act of Congress, um, which is not, not an easy task, but I guess to answer your question, like, I think absolutely. I would love to see it cover more students. So that's that's a half answer to your question, I guess. <laughs> and maybe not particularly helpful, but something to work towards, definitely. All right. 
Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, so we are going to pivot, like Beth said, to have our final um, speaker. We were supposed to have two regional folks join us today. And unfortunately, Sarah Russell with the city of Burlington is has the flu. So we will potentially hear from her at another point. Um, but I want to go ahead and introduce um, Kristen Pryor, who is an AHS field director for Lamoille and Franklin Grant Isle, um, and is joining us today to talk a little bit more about transitional housing. Go ahead, Kristen. Thank you so much. Um, wow, I always learn so much. This has been great so far. So um, you've heard all about all the programs and everything. And so the agency um, said, what are we gonna do at the end of March? You know, um, And one of our biggest barriers is we do not have um, like a department or a person in charge of housing. It's really all across six departments in the agency. And so that makes it hard because it's not like that's your responsibility. It's kind of everybody's responsibility. And as an agency, we don't have a great way to share um, information and data across our six departments. We don't have a platform where that happens. And so the secretary, um, really was looking for data around this group of people that were holding in the hotels and what are their barriers to being successful or getting housed. And so we are doing this project that is really about gathering information with the hope of then being able to do shared case plans, uh, assign housing case management to people and help them transition um, if they can. So I'm just gonna show you really quickly, I won't go through all the slides, but some of them. And if you have not heard about in this year in your region, it's, it's happening or about to happen. So uh, this really includes the whole agency of human services, but our teams are gonna have, um, okay, so here's the project overview. Um, connect with everybody that's in the transitional housing program, better understand their needs, resource gaps, remove barriers, identify uh, resource gaps and inform state leadership and decision-making and the legislature is another piece. So the teams consist of a person from the agency, one from higher ability, which used to be Voc Rehab, one from the Vermont Vermont Chronic Care Initiative, which is out of the Department of Aging and Independent Living, and that's a nurse, and somebody from Economic Services. And uh, they partner with the local housing support staff, transition about 100 people per team. And so in Lamoille, that transitions to about 33 people, I think. We'll see the numbers in a minute. And um, the teams are starting. They started in October, they started in very first. And they're gonna do outreach. Um, and we've already done all the outreach in Morrisville. Uh, we have them sign a consent to participate in a shared screening tool that goes into a database that will give us a lot of information. It's a very comprehensive screening tool. This is all voluntarily voluntary, and it can include case coordination, case conferencing. Um, so there are teams across the state based on this 100 per team number, based on the number of literally homeless people we have in hotels. St. Albans gets one. I think Burlington has three or four now, actually, because uh, you include Burlington and Middlebury. And then our team is part of the Northeast Kingdom. Um, because but those three districts make up almost 100. And so that's been a tricky thing, but we're working through it. So there's an initial email and then the team meets. ESD has gone out and had the screenings signed. They did it while they were doing um, updates for transitional housing for recertification. Local teams then convene with leadership to plan. Um, and do a coordinated service plan. After we complete the tool, that'll happen, case conferencing and case assignment, and then ongoing care coordination. 
uh, the tool is mostly demographics and barriers. Like what is stopping you? Uh, let's see, they're going out in teams of two or three. And in Lamoille County, I'm very proud to say that our uh, community partners have gone out, Alex Wheeler and Lita have both gone out and done screenings with state staff. And without them, we couldn't have got that done, which helps build the local team. And Barry was the kind of our test site and it went really well. Um, we're gonna use this to inform case management, local teams, regional specific release, and inform the legislature. And then I'm gonna close this one and show you where we are with the state outcomes today. Oh, I wanted to go back there. Let me see if I can fix it. There it is. So this morning or yesterday, I'm not sure when this one came out. It looks like yesterday at 8 or 2. There were 1,377 households and hotels. There have been 433 screen, 31%. But I think the interesting number is people who signed releases to do the screening were at 75% across the state, which is really exciting because we've never been able to capture this information. And probably we could have, would have, should have started at the beginning of COVID but it's better that we're catching it now than never. Um, and it shows you then adults who have been screened. Um, and you know we get really good reports every day and we're learning so much by putting these teams together. So it's been uh, quite a whirlwind to get this up and running across the state, but our hope is to be able to share this with the legislature to inform decisions moving forward because we'll have real data in real time from people where they are. And that's an important piece of this is that we've been very much encouraging that this all happens on site in the hotels when it's comfortable for people. Obviously, if that doesn't work for people, we'll do it on the phone, we'll do it in the offices, we'll do it wherever it works for them. But we're really trying to learn and just a quick little um, ancillary tale in St. Albans, they wanted a um, tent because the hotels in St. Albans don't have uh, a common area that we can meet with people or a place that's confidential. And they uh, researched and found this pop-up ice shanty that um, is big enough to put a table to divide it in two and so they can do two screenings at a time and they run an electric cord out and they put up Christmas lights and a sheet to divide it. They have, um, there, sorry, they have um, a noise machine so that they can sit side by side with people and, and actually do this confidentially. And I have to say, I was a little bit um, disdainful about the ice shanty, but it turned out to be such a good thing to do because it's red. And as soon as they show up and set up the ice shanty and they put a schedule out to the community, to people in hotels, uh, as soon as they show up and set up, people just glom to them because they bring resources every time. They bring socks, they bring gloves, they bring all kinds of things. And they're building a relationship with these people. Uh, along with community providers in a way that um, I think is benefiting everybody. So while we're not in any way thinking we can house all these people by the end of March, we are trying to figure out how um, and what they need to successfully transition and to look at them again. In some places, if we have time, we go back to people that uh, we didn't capture because we didn't contact them or they might have said, I don't know but we go back and offer it again because we really do want to understand. So higher ability is there to increase income or bring some income to the uh, household if it's possible. And the BPSs are there around the transitional housing program, research, all that stuff, because they actually have a relationship with these people who have been going out. And the VCCI nurses are there because their role is to kind of assess in the moment, like, what's happening with people and make a, appropriate referrals. And then in a longer term situation, 
how do we get them PCPs if they don't have one, get them connected, keep them out of the emergency rooms, and just overall try and get them to cost us all left, less by being um, a part of the system and involved with a primary care physician or a mental health care provider or a social worker or wh whoever it is that they have a relationship with to use that as an in to keep building relation and figuring out how we get people housed, knowing that there's almost no housing stock. So we're trying to gather information. That's the big thing here because that's what we've really lacked. It sounds silly, but we are capturing it. So that's good news. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, any clarifying questions for Kristen? Amazing creative strategies. I appreciate you sharing them with us. Well, it was this came straight out of the secretary's office. I have to say, Jenny Samuelson, Todd Dolaz, and Sarah Truckle, I think, get the kudos for this because I think they got really frustrated with the lack of data. Interesting. All right. Any other questions before we transition to discussion? All right. Well, we've we've made quite a tour around Vermont and our housing strategies, right? In just an hour. Um, so would invite folks if you're able to turn your screen back on for our discussion and would love, let's start with the assets that we've heard, just um anything kind of cool, creative. Like we heard about kind of some really interesting, both needs and strategies. So anything new that you learned or um, what do you feel like are some of our strengths and our responses in, in Vermont? And then we can shift to a discussion around kind of where are the gaps at the intersection of early childhood and serving families and housing um, and to, to figure out some strategies there. Yeah, Kristen. So when I came to Lamoille County, I was just amazed and awed and in wonder about Jenna's promise and all the work that that family has done in that community um, and continues to do on a daily basis. And I think that because Vermont is such a small state that that is one key component to us is that we have to engage community partners and real people that can make um, changes and help us lead in the community. And they are incredible leaders in this work to destigmatize mental health, addiction, um, single family, you know, single parents, all kinds of things. And so I think that is one place that we uh, need to continue to help uplift and figure out how to get them at the table across all our communities, uh, partners like that. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things I'm so excited about is where we started with family um, supportive housing and uh, Lily's presentation. And I, um, because I think finding housing is, of course, a huge challenge. Um, but keeping the housing, if we, you know, really working on that part so that people are successful once they get the housing um, just seems so important to me. And I know. I'm still learning about this, but I know in some regions, um, family supportive housing and CIS work very closely together. Sometimes they, um, the person who in the agency that channels referrals to CIS is the same as the person that channels referrals to um, family supportive housing. And there's a lot of collaboration there. I, um, Brattleboro stands out, um, St. Albans as examples, and there may be more. Um, so that's something I'm excited about. Thank you. Any other strengths or successes we just want to call out? I, hi, I'm, I'm kind of a guest on today's meeting. I'm Beverly from the Vermont Early Childhood Advocacy Alliance. This is an area that we're focusing on um, as part of our legislative agenda. So I really feel so honored to have learned all of this super great information. Um, and I, I think for me, just having some understanding and some data and information about families and what families are experiencing is really helpful. 
being able to kind of quantify it. Thank you. So I wonder if we want to, I, I would be curious what people are hearing, what kind of themes are you hearing around gaps in our system um, that remain despite kind of all of these efforts? Um, or if there are regional partners that kind of want to share your perspective of what you're seeing families are facing, um, we'll just open it for discussion. Yeah, Kristen, go ahead. I just noticed that Dave Regal is with us and he's the AHS housing director. And so he could talk more if he wants to about uh, this transitional housing program data dive um, because he's the, the power behind it, pushing it out, so. Thanks, Kristen. I, uh, I think you did a great job covering it. Happy to answer questions if people, you know, have things that they want to dip into uh, more in depth, but also want to be respectful of the time and, and give you folks an opportunity to, you know, have have the open discussion. So here is a resource if, if folks are interested. Cool. Thanks for being with us. I see other hands, Kea and then Cynthia. So wearing my hat, you know, as Director of Trauma Prevention and Resilience Development, that's really where I go to is just the amount of trauma these families experience that people don't always think about when they're thinking about homelessness or people who are couch surfing, you know, at least, you know, there's so many people who are like, at least they have roofs over their heads. Well, that doesn't matter if it's not a stable roof. So I'm just sort of sitting here and thinking about another area where I probably need to do some outreach and support and training to give people the tools to deal with the trauma reactions and help build resilience. So it's just another place that I need to clone myself to be, I think. So true. Thank you. Cynthia? Thanks, Beth. Um, I've just sort of been mulling over listening to all this, and I'm curious, do we have any data that is linking um, kind of concrete needs to the federal poverty level? And <laughs> looking at this, I mean, amazing housing costs, I, I'm, I knew it was high, but I was floored by the numbers because I, I barely afford housing and I pay way more than 30% of my income. Oh, Cynthia, you just muted yourself. My cat just muted there you me. Go. Sorry All about right. that. <laughs> I was just saying, um, I'm curious about the data and or the intersect around um, eligibility, federal poverty level, uh, benefits cliff, and thinking about concrete supports, you know, everything from food and housing. And I just wanted to say, you know, I know housing is a challenge. I've experienced it myself. I was floored, though, by the numbers, especially the Chittenden County statistics. I don't know how anybody affords that in our state on the level of salaries that we have. So I'm just curious, do we have data around sort of these eligibility guidelines, and are they continuing to be based on federal poverty levels that don't really reflect Vermont, uh, or at least I feel they don't really reflect Vermont conditions very well. Cindy, sorry to just wanted to put an ad thing because you made me think of something and how our mapping project might be helpful data for people to have. And I'll let you speak on it more because you're much better about it than I am. I can do that, Kea, but I'm going to hold off um, if people have heard about it a little bit, but we can do that again. Yes, the mapping project um, looks at child opportunity index data with uh, food deserts, et cetera, et cetera. But I am curious about my question if anybody has an idea around it. Can you rephrase your question, Cynthia, because I'm not totally I'm not totally clear what you're asking. Is it that you're asking how Vermont housing data compares to other FPL like program data or are you asking about it compared to like 
affordability or all of the above? <laughs> Great question, Carrie. I think in my head, I'm just, I'm really curious about sort of the intersect of how we determine eligibility for any of these programs and including housing and how federal poverty levels uh, you know, either impact or don't impact eligibility for these programming for these programs, right? And I think I don't know, <laughs> right? This is the data I'm sort of looking for with this intersect. Are we missing some data about the conditions in Vermont, especially around housing and how um, costly it is and how the gap between eligibility if it's based on federal poverty level and that federal poverty level doesn't really reflect conditions in Vermont. Um, and we've talked in Vermont a long time about all kinds of benefit cliffs, but I think in the housing world, when I looked at some of those numbers that were put up on the board, I, I, I'm just floored. If you need $23 an hour more than for a two bedroom unit and then units aren't available so we know they're probably far exceeding that 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 um, type of income. It just makes me wonder <laughs> like how do we redefine eligibility um, in Vermont to better meet the needs of, of families who can't access. Um, programming. And I know there's all kinds of federal stuff in here too, but I just am curious about data around sort of those intersections. Um, I can give a, a piece of an answer to that if that's, if that's okay. And, and, and so the, the big, an, the big answer to your question is yes, there is an inconsistency and it, and we are faced with, um, federal you know federal requirements um that do result in in the in these cliffs um and you know we've seen it we saw it in fact really clearly with our cares housing voucher program last last year where we did have some flexibility where we could um uh, have some some waivers for for uh uh, FMR values to provide vouchers for folks at a slightly higher level than would otherwise be, be allowed. But then when these families were transitioning to a housing choice voucher, the you know because of the federal the 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 the, the federal requirements on the 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 rent amounts that put them in a sticky situation so there is something that needs to change in terms of how these these levels are determined uh, based on the realities of what's happening in Vermont because rents are skyrocketing um, we we hear from folks every day on our hotline that their rents are being raised by several hundred dollars a month um, and folks can you. Know, can't can't keep up with it. So there's no I don't have an answer for you other than the fact that yes, you've identified a very pertinent issue. <laughs> right. And we are kind of capturing some of these questions as gaps, right? Um, so thank you for trying to respond, Jess and um and noted, Cynthia. I would love to hear um others have, yeah, um response. Lily, it looks like you have a response to this question, and then we can hear from Carrie. We can't hear you though. Oh, does that work? There we go. Okay, you're good. Um, just in terms of eligibility, it, it really does vary sort of benefit to benefit program to program. So when it comes to services, a lot of services for households who are literally homeless do not have then an associated income level for the service. So if a house is experiencing literally homeless, a service provider wouldn't be saying, what's your income? But I think then it, it comes into play when you're exploring different like rental assistance, which varies, you know, Vermont um, Emergency Rental Assistance Program, which is a COVID relief program, had um, very different income eligibility than other programs. So it varies, but just um, to be, so that was one thing to be mindful of. And then HUD does kind of release state and um, county-based data. And in the past, and I believe they're exploring this right now, Vermont Housing Finance Administration has conducted internal sort of like audits, so to speak, of rents across the state to then go back to HUD and say, hey, we need to have this revisited. So there is sort of a mechanism in place. It's not necessarily a quick fix, but um, it is, the HUD guidelines do, again, vary county by county in each community. So it's not just like across the board. 
and there is sort of this way to respond. But um, again, it, it you really have to kind of put together this proposal of of why we would want to use a higher level um, standard. And again, to Jess's point, depending on the funding, it might be that it's the HUD fair market, or again, it could be like a rent reasonable standard that programs have if they're using general fund dollars. So just important things to keep in mind. And again, a great point. Thank you, Lily. Would love to hear other observations. Carrie, you've had your hand up. Thank you. And then Megan. Mine doesn't totally. Well, it relates a little bit to what um, Cynthia was asking about. And I'll just share that in the in the sort of food security realm, we often get a lot of questions about how to appropriately serve um, families and you know people in general who are experiencing. Um, homelessness or really housing insecure and those folks often need different kinds of supports than our regular folks like we're not going to deliver a whole head of cabbage and a whole uh, winter squash to somebody who doesn't have access to a kitchen but that's often what's available so we're our teams are really looking at ways to understand um, you know what what families in particular need, uh, especially now we're getting tons and tons of inquiries from schools about our backpack program, like a huge influx compared to what we had even during the pandemic. Um, and backpack is a program that sends uh, food home with kids so they can eat it over the weekend and it's not really supposed to require parents or help <laughs> to prepare it, um, even for relatively young kids. Um, so I'm just curious, as, as we're all talking about this housing perspective um, and the data around it, one of the things that we often don't know being the provider sort of at the end of the line is how many folks are having these experiences and how to sort of best count them and access them so that we can even order the, the right kinds of food in the right amounts. And is that something that AHS is starting to sort of keep track of with some of this data that you're where you're signing folks up for this or is that um is that still more of sort of the regional you know assistance programs that are, are most aware of those things like where is that information available um and how how can we as a service provider for often you know a, a sort of limited um place of the, the unhoused population plug into that or make sure that we're in appropriate communication with folks who can help connect with those people because I think there's potentially services that don't exist right now that we're like thinking about how to connect people with but um are not e it's not even entirely clear how how we find them anybody thank you or how we question. keep track of them yeah mm -hmm. Any initial responses or thoughts to Carrie's question, or we can kind of note it as a as a gap. It may just be a notable gap. Yeah. Well, and that's Are I think. Are you thinking? Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, Carrie, like try how to reach people on site? Is that sort of? No, actually, we know how to do that. Usually, it's yeah. often with our cat partners, um, you know, and yeah. some other local partners, or through schools. It's how to know. Uh, it's 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 really technical. It's like how to know how many people, you know, so we can, it takes a while to order food, it turns out, like some several months. So knowing, you know, if some of these programs are changing, if if we're seeing mm. this like big shift, if you know, to, to be able to appropriately respond, we have mm. to be able to at least guesstimate how, you know, how many pop top cans we might need so that folks mm. don't need can openers or you know, other other types of really specific food resources for folks. And and it this also relates to some of our SNAP outreach, right? And our partners who are doing that to make sure that those folks are getting access to to um you know federal so resources. Is it like a count of households experiencing homelessness every month, every six months. I'm still trying to be, figure out what the ask be may yeah, be. Yeah, it could be that. It could be some kind of count for households experiencing homelessness. It could be some kind of count of families 
who are accessing McKinney Vento who need this same kind of support. Like it, it could be any of those things. Is anyone counting? That's kind of the question. Well, there's counting and then there's some anticipatory planning involved right. at a statewide level that I'm hearing you ask for, which is yeah. a really interesting question. And is there a table who's doing that or is that a gap, right? Right. Or is is there a table that's doing that maybe for families with children, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and there's other populations that need to have that done in other ways. Like is, is any of that, does that sound familiar? Through the coordinated <laughs> entry process, we have for those who are getting the assessment we have that data um you know again everything is sort of just priority and time and so right now i don't think there's like a monthly report that's being pulled but that is point in time data that can be accessed is like how many households in each community have been assessed as experiencing literal homelessness so that data is there again that relies on sort of the self-report of people identifying themselves as homeless. So you have people that, that may not have gone through the assessment. Um, you know, economic services also has, you know, their participation numbers that can be accessed at any point in time. Um, so that data exists. And I think, again, maybe to Beth's point, it's just, you know, who are the right people who should be getting that data at what frequency? what is needed and then is you know kind of that negotiation of then like um how easy is it to get and what's the frequency that could make sense but those are two data sources that do exist but again um at least for the hmis coordinated entry data really rely on the fact that the person has gone through the assessment thank you thanks lily so interesting. And I really appreciate the time to have different partners <laughs> here. You know, Child Outcomes Accountability Team, this is one of the strategic plan committees for the Vermont Early Childhood Action Plan, right? So we're thinking strategy, longer term. This group particularly looks at the intersection of kind of kids and families, prenatal through age eight, and the intersection of social determinants of health for the most part. Um, and so we decided to come together around housing. And I think it is really interesting to kind of bring this group of partners together. And so um, just moment on my soapbox to say, if there, if you're not usually sitting at a table with others um, who showed up today and you feel like there's a connection that you want to pursue and, and you need their contact information, let us know, contact Anna or I, and we can help you make that connection. Because I feel like, you know, we've kind of opened the box, right? And I would imagine these conversations happen at multiple other tables um, and it doesn't need to happen or shouldn't happen here long-term, right? But we kind of wanted to bring these early childhood and housing partners together to say, what's working? What are some statewide and regional strategies? And where are the gaps, right? And are those gaps already identified and tracked? Or is this a function of strategically bringing partners together periodically to say, um, what are these gaps and where can we work on them? Like, are there data, you know, is someone tracking the data gaps that we've mentioned, or is this something that we, that we want to kind of add to some of our tools that we track around um, data gaps in the system that affect children and families? So that's just, just a little bit of kind of what I'm hearing and not sitting at all those other housing tables. Um, I don't necessarily know where those gaps are or where there's redundancy. So um, would love the perspective offline can happen from housing partners in particular about kind of, are these conversations happening where there can be a handoff to be like, yeah, that conversation really informed what I can bring to this table or, hey, this isn't happening anywhere else. So clearly we're at 1030 and um, a conversation either for another table or for another time and we're happy to kind of continue it on. So, um, Megan, I know that you had your hand up and we are also coming to a place where we'd love any updates or announcements. So um, Megan, I would love to hear your kind of comment um, and then we'll open it if others want to kind of share reflections or announcements as you have them. Sure, yeah, I did just have a comment, not really a question for further discussion, but um, I am also a guest here today. I don't normally sit at um, this team. I uh, work for Kids Safe Collaborative, which is a Chittenden County-based 
um, organization that really focuses on um, improving child welfare through a collaborative and coordinated response. Um, and I'm just sort of wanted to share that from KidSafe's perspective, we're hearing consistently that housing is an issue for the families that, um, you know, we're kind of working to support through our child protection teams and then also through the partners that we help support. And so I think a little bit like Kaya was saying earlier is that um, it's not just housing or just mental health or just this, just that, like the acuity is um, really striking about how much children, youth and families are struggling with kind of all this intersection of trauma and needs. Um, and my other related thought was really thinking about the housing stock and, you know, even if families are connected and supported, if housing isn't available, it's not available, um, even if the support is there. And so just wondering how um, kind of the early childhood world can leverage kind of our expertise and knowledge to, you know, advocate for the housing stock, which I think is often seen more from like an economic standpoint, um, and just wondering how we can join that conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Megan. Great points. All right. Um, we've taken quite the tour. We have a lot of resources. Thanks, Jess, for putting more in the chat. So we will kind of try and compile these into the notes. Um, and this is recorded, of course, so um, that might be helpful for those of us who need a refresh. Any other announcements or updates that folks want to make while we're here? I can say one that um, Building Bright Futures will publish our 2022 State of Vermont's Children Year in Review, 2022 Year in Review report in early January with a briefing. Um, so we can get that, that invite um, out to you. But um, I definitely heard interest in leaning into data. And um, so invite you to join us for that briefing. Any other announcements? Okay, great discussion, probably to be continued. Um, you know, any other connections that you need offline, feel free to, to send us a message. So um, please join us um, at a future meeting. We'd love to see you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye, thank you.